Hey, everybody. In this episode, it's myself, Ben, and Josh. In this episode, we're discussing a lot. We're talking about who is appropriate to work in the industry of substance abuse. Who's it not appropriate for? When is the right time to get involved in this field? If you're on a journey of sobriety and you want to get involved in this field, how long should you wait? Josh got sober at a very young age. We discussed that process, what that was like for him. He did transition to Florida, but it did take him a couple of years to finally get clean and sober. And we discussed details as to why. Josh has worked in this field now for 19 years. He has a ton of knowledge when it comes to the substance abuse industry and the mental health industry. We cover all that and more. Enjoy the show. Here we are, Real Recovery Talk. I am your host, Tom Conrad. In today's episode, we've got Benjamin B. What's up, everyone? And we have a gentleman by the name of Josh. What's up, Josh? How are you? First things first, thank you, thank you, thank you for tuning in on the podcast app, whichever one that you choose to use, and thank you for watching on YouTube. In the end, if you have any comments, questions, or concerns, you can always reach us, info at realrecoverytalk.com. Again, that's info at realrecoverytalk.com. And ultimately, we want to help you turn your mess into your message. Ben. Yes, sir. I I was gasping for air there like you are after you take three or four steps. I know. <laughs> you all right? <laughs> yeah. Put the Celsius down. Yeah. You can have a heart attack on me, dude. Hey, also, I want to let you know about our support group that's on Facebook. You can find that on Facebook. Just go on Facebook, type in Real Recovery Talk Support Group. Click Join Group. There's a couple questions that you need to answer, and then we're going to let you in. Uh, it's almost at 400 people, so we're getting up there. Um, and then also you can go to realrecoverytalk.com slash guide. There you're going to find assessments that you can just put your email in, download them, fill out these assessments, and uh, give you some clarity around your situation, whether it's for you or for somebody that you know and love. If you're trying to figure out if you're codependent or if you're trying to figure out you're an alcoholic, you can go to realrecoverytalk.com slash guide and uh, do the assessment and you're going to get your answer. So anything else, Ben? I think you got it all, Tom. All right. I usually zone out at this point when you're doing those. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that's okay. <laughs> uh, so Josh is here with us. Uh, full transparency. Uh, I know you by name and uh, Ben... I think text me or called me a few couple weeks ago or last week or something and said, Hey, I got this guy, Josh, that's going to come on the show. And I said, okay, sounds good. And, um, you've been, I, so prior to recording you and Ben were chatting it up a little bit sure. and heard, uh, a good amount of what you guys were talking about. You've worked in this field a long time. I have, uh, about 19 years. Wow. 19 years. That's that's like a real elder in the field, dude. Because we're pushing what twelve years, thirteen. We went over this yesterday, Ben. Yeah. Oh yeah. For you, thirteen. Me, twelve. Because I started <laughs> yeah. to. All right. I'm your elder. Yeah. You always got a one up. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, nineteen years is a long yeah. time. So listen, the format is total organic. We don't sure. have anything scripted. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Where you're from? What were you gonna say? I want to give them the opportunity to open up because it's for a good cause. Josh has a fight coming up in Miami. Oh, yeah. For Parkinson's, MS. I, I you want to touch on that real sure, quick? Sure, sure, sure. Um, I got back into boxing a couple years ago and um, had the opportunity to do a charity fight down in Miami on October 12th. It's called Punch for Parkinson's. It's ran by Ryan Roach, who's the uh, son of uh, Freddie Roach, um, who's a known, um, known for, um, known former boxer, former, former trainer, um, you know, dealt with Parkinson's himself. Um, so all the all the proceeds go for Parkinson's and MS research, um, and that's October twelfth down in Miami at the uh, Miami Hilton Blue Lagoon, um, and you can uh, pretty much tickets are still available. Cool, um, Miami uh, Hilton Hilton Blue, Blue Lagoon. Lagoon. Huh. I know a lot of people going. I'm out of town that week I in know. North Carolina at my cousin's wedding. Oh, you are? Yeah. Did you put in a time for going? <laughs> Did you put in a time request form, Ben? Not yet. Oh, okay. Melissa's going to shoot me. All right. It's on yeah. the board. You should get on that. You know, fill out those TPS reports too when you're done. 
Uh, Josh, appreciate you coming on. Tell Thanks us a little bit me. about yourself and where you're from, stuff like sure, that. Sure, sure, sure. I'm from uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Um, I got sober on April 17th, 2005. So I'm um, God willing, I'm coming up on 20 years. Um, moved to Florida in 2003, um, back when there was not a lot of treatment centers down here in South Florida. And, um, you know, didn't get it right my first try or my second try, but finally, uh, you know, so far so good on my uh, third try trying to do this. What what brought you here? So you didn't find your way to Florida by way of treatment. What brought you here to begin with? No, I did. That that was that was how I got here. Oh, uh, oh, right. Yes. So you came down in 03 to get clean, and but didn't actually did, get clean. Did not actually get clean for for a good year and a half. Um, and um, because I thought that the geographical change was uh the solution. And I, as we all know, you, we bring ourselves everywhere we go. So uh, just how I got into some trouble up in Philadelphia, I found trouble down here in South Florida. And um, when uh, it took me about three stints of trying to do this before uh, I finally was able to start getting my act together. Was it opiates or opiates, opiates and alcohol? What introduced you to opiates? Um, I would, it kind of just fell into my lap. Um, first, there was a couple of sports injuries that uh, that was my first real introduction to, you know, Percocet, you know, Oxycontin. Um, and then um, at the time, heroin started running rampant um, in my, my little area of Philadelphia. And, uh, you know, people thought because we snorted it that it was not a, uh, it was different than being a being a junkie, and um, so that was the thing. Everybody used to sniff sniff heroin, um, and then because I saw a bunch of other people doing it, I was intoxicated at the time, um, drunk, and uh, I decided, hey, let me give this a shot, and that's how I st- unfortunately started doing heroin. Wow, yeah, and the wheels started falling off when you were up there. Pretty much, um, you know, I, I started when I was uh, nineteen years old. And then, uh, and then by the time I was w- within two years, it was already, I lost everything, failed out of college up there. Um, and, um, was back home living with my parents, um, because, uh, literally less than two years, I would say a year and a half of, of doing it. Wow. I want, I was doing the math in my head earlier too, where, so you were 23 years old when you got so. Yes, Correct. I want to point that out, man, because a lot of times, like our listeners, parents and loved ones listen in a lot of time and they're like, oh, my kid's so young. Or even the addicts themselves, they're like, I'm so young. Mm -hmm. I'm not ready to do this or I'm going to be missing out or all my friends. Like, here, proof in the pudding. It's doable. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think what what, what did it, you know, because before I came to Florida, my parents had already, um, my dad had already retired, my mom semi-retired, and they bought a house down here in Boynton Beach. And little did I know that where I was going to be going to treatment was literally five miles away from away from their house, and and which was good and bad. Good because when I got into problems down here, or or bad when I because I, when I got into problems down here is that they always were bailed me out at first. My my parent my parents would um you know they they were they were enablers. Um but it was um good because finally the last straw what got me sober um that that got me sober was I stole from my mom and dad when I literally lost nothing had nothing. I I stole jewelry from my mom that went five generations back to Russia and she pressed charges on me and it was the best thing that ever happened to me. Um, I was the first person in the state of Florida that was put into drug court for a non-drug related crime, meaning it was not possession. It was not, um, it was not possession. It was not intent to sell or distribute. My charge was grand larceny. And my mom went in front of the judge and said that, Hey, like my son's not a criminal. He just has a drug problem and he needs help. So they court ordered, court ordered me to drug court and mandated me to six months of treatment at a, at a state facility down here. What state facility did you uh, go to? I went to DAF. All right. Um, I, I, went, <laughs> I, went, I went to DAF and, uh, and that's what got me, got me sober because watching how much I hurt my mom and seeing my dad, who was a former Marine, cry. First time in my whole entire life, I actually saw the man, saw the man cry. That's what, you know, besides being court ordered, just, that alone, whether I was quartered or not quartered, that did it for me. I want to touch on some. I, if I if I'm understanding and piecing this together correctly, sure. 
So we were talking a little bit before we hit record. You came down here. You went to a place called Behavioral Health at Palm Beaches. So that was the first one? That was the original one, yep. And where you actually ended up getting clean and sober and staying clean and sober was DAF. Correct. So I, I just want to point this out because Tom, Tom always says the recovery begins when the insurance ends. Mm -hmm. Like, is it, you know, people use that insurance card just to bounce in and out. Absolutely. Like, like an Amex. And I, I want to bring it up because, like, you went to the nice place. Mm -hmm. And then DAF being state funded, like it's. Oh, the it, first day, the first day I was there, I asked them where do I take my dry cleaning, and they're like, I don't know where you've been before, but this isn't where this is <laughs> this isn't it. Um, <laughs> and uh, and the, and because uh, I I I was used to that, I was used yeah. to you know, but but this was when Behavioral Health of Palm Beaches was its own entity. It was across from John Prince Park on Lake uh, in uh, in Lake Worth. Um, and it was one of the original treatment centers down here in South Florida. And, and, um, it was pretty much, you know, all upper middle class, middle class, fa um, upper middle class to upper class families from the Northeast. And, you know, you were catered to, everything was done for you. And I'm like, my, my mom was a Philly school teacher. So at the time she had that, she had that Philadelphia teachers, uh, union insurance, which was mm -hmm. great. Um, you know, which was a great insurance. So they took me with no problem. So I was used to being catered and it was ending, actually ending up in the state facility where there was no dry cleaning that, uh, that, that, you know, is pretty much what I needed. Cause it gets real. Oh, it definitely got real in there. <laughs> so did you, did you ha still have access to that insurance and you still had to go to a state facility no at that time there was so there was no such thing as the um obamacare the an aca policy at the time so i did age off her her insurance and she was not a philadelphia school teacher anymore so i had no insurance oh okay so you go into daf and it's a reality check for you um what was that process were you there for six months i was there for six months what was it like in there um it was, I know I've never spent a lot of time in jail. Um, at max 48 hours, um, was the most, most of our time I've ever spent in jail. But, uh, it was, it was essentially almost being like, being like prison. Um, cause a lot of, some people really did have drug and alcohol problems. A lot of people, time people were other, other type of criminals trying to use drug, dr uh, dr drug abuse as an excuse to not be in jail, not be in prison. So it was pretty much, it was kind of like being in, being in jail. It was a jailhouse mentality, but at the, at the same time, that's exactly what I needed. Um, because I was a 23 year old punk that, um, that always, you know, popped his mouth off to people. And, uh, and I learned that I needed to just sit there, shut up and listen. It was a humbling experience. Very humbling. Yeah. yeah I went to carp twice for D which dude, same thing. Roth. Yes. J I'd rather be in jail. <laughs> I know that now than carp. Like you bang on that big metal door and dude, that, that was a terrible experience. Oh, terrible. I, the food was better in jail. Oh, than I, at carp. of course. But so for the listeners, I mean, to break this down in simplistic terms, basically in terms of treatment, you have two different options down here. Well, you have three. Um, one is you go to a private facility in some capacity and you utilize your private health insurance that's through an employer or through Obamacare or the marketplace or whatever. You have your typical Blue Cross Blue Shield. There's treatment centers out there that can service you. Um, second option is going to a state-ran facility where they get grants and assistance from the state to be able to facilitate these treatment centers. And uh, they're generally subpar treatment i suppose is the best way to put it uh because the employees probably don't really like their jobs the clients that are there for the most part don't want to be there so on and so forth and then your third option is going to be you know if you're lucky enough and you walk into a meeting or something and you know hear the right message at the right time and detox on your friend's couch and you know get clean that way um a lot of times people take option one for granted, you know, the private health insurance. Oh, I'm down here on mom and dad's insurance and look at me, I can go wherever I want, which is true. And that's the unfortunate thing because knowing that you have private health insurance and you can go to basically whatever facility it is that you want, it 
makes it very difficult for somebody to buy into this whole sober lifestyle because, well, if I don't like this treatment center, all I got to do is go back out and get high and then I can go to another one and then another one and then another one. And that's how we saw people getting on this whole South Florida, you know, shuffle. Shuffle. And it's unfortunate. So that's why I say, uh, I, I don't say it, but recovery starts when the insurance stops. A lot of times we see people get clean and sober whenever they don't have access to that anymore. And that was your situation. Absolutely. So I do believe though, that seeds are planted like, cause, cause in my experience, all the places that I went previously at the end, I didn't get to go to treatment. I had no resources left Mm -hmm. the last time. And it's because of all that previous experience in treatment. So it wasn't time wasted. I want to throw that out there. Absolutely. 100%. 100%. Like, it, it let me know what's out there. Meetings, good therapy, mm-hmm. sober support community. Especially in Florida, you get exposed to this culture down here that's here. And I wouldn't have known that, being out at the bars and of course all that. So, so uh, I wanted to ask you this in the beginning. Are you an Eagles fan? I am an Eagles fan. Did you watch a game last night? I did watch the game last night. That's unfortunate. I know. I grew up in Pittsburgh, so I'm a Steeler fan. Okay. So, But, you know, it is what it is. Uh, I've, been, dude, I've been dodging footballs all day today. So yeah, everybody that's called me that I, when I see the number, I know that they're calling and talk to me about the game, and I just hit the. Uh, <laughs> it was crazy. Hit the button. I mean, just the total. I mean, blew it. But I tell you what, Atlanta came out. They they uh, fulfilled their duty. They did. All right, let's move on. Um, when did you get involved in the field then? So I nine months. I when I got when I got my started getting my act together, and I realized that this what is that this is for real now. Like, um, this is like my way of life. This is how I'm going to live the rest of my life. I wanted to go back to school. I originally went to school for communications at Ryder university and uh, which is right outside Trenton, New Jersey. Um, it's also where my addiction picked, p- picked up. Um, but I knew once I got, you know, got sober that I wanted to help people. Um, so I, so I enrolled myself back in school and I got, got a job as a tech at behavioral health, the po- or actually my first job was at the watershed, um, where I was an overnight tech working uh, midnight to 8 a.m., um, uh, five to six, six days a week. So I got into this, I started working in this field about nine months sober, um, nine months sober in 2000, the end of 2004, no, actually it was like the beginning, of the, or I'm sorry, the end of uh, 2005, the beginning of 2006. What was that like? I mean, we, we oftentimes hear people, I'm, I'm, I'm speculating here, but okay, right now we have, how many people we have in in our census? 25. 25. How many out of those 25, if you ask them, what, Hey, what do you want to do moving forward? How many of them do you think would say, Oh, I want to work in treatment? Probably a third, a third. I would say that's a fair number. A lot of people want to work in treatment. Um, Generally, it's the ones that don't have a previous job that want to, because right now, a lot of our clients have jobs that they came from and they're yeah. on leave leave of absence, FMLA and all that stuff. But well, a lot yeah, of the if younger, no, yeah, if someone has no direction and no employment and they're here, that's usually the direction they want to go. And it's a lot of it has to do with the, I think the younger crowd, because they don't, they haven't had enough time to establish a mm-hmm. career and those sorts of things. And listen, I'm not against people getting involved and working in the field. I think it's great for people uh, if you're the right person and if you do it at the right time. Um, Unfortunately, in this day and age, and I'd be curious to know your thoughts on this, Josh. I I know of places now that literally will hire people with 90 days sober as like a tech or, you know, like what's your thoughts on that? So it was even, I remember my sponsor even said, questioning me that with nine months sober should i even work, 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 work in this field so so um and uh and he actually i ended up actually ended up working with him at my second job but um i think at 90 days clean like you don't even know how to take care of yourself yet so how can you take care of yourself or how can you take care of someone else if you can't even take care of yourself um i i i think that's doing a disservice to not only the patients but um, I think it's doing a disservice to the person because a lot of times people 
start working in this industry and they start t- thinking that their job is their recovery. Um, I've seen that happen to a lot of people over the years and they stop taking care of themselves and they stop doing what they need to do for themselves, go to meetings, talking to their sponsor, doing step work and, and, um, and then some life situation happens with 90 days or 120 days or six months or even a year, two years. And because they, they've let their job they think that their job is their own recovery, they go back out. So in my opinion, 90 days, should somebody work in this field in 90 days? Absolutely not. I probably shouldn't have even been working in this field with nine months clean. I'll say this too. One of the things that I tend to see is when people get into the field too early, especially if you're frontline staff, like a tech, Mm -hmm. we have to build relationships with clients. It's rapport. I mean, that's human services 101. The scary thing is though, is that for somebody that's brand new to sobriety, The way that they know how to connect and relate to people who are in treatment is through war stories and the street mentality. Absolutely. Where for us, we've been sober long enough where we can relate to them with that, Mm -hmm. but that's not the basis of our relationship, if that makes sense. Because we're able to maintain like this this professional presence Mm -hmm. versus like, because I've seen a lot of times like young kids in their early 20s getting involved in treatment. Next thing you know, they're like, you wouldn't know the difference between them and staff because they're acting like the clients. And it's not intentional, and they're not doing it consciously, but they just fall into it because they haven't been far enough removed and sober long enough to be able to recognize the difference within themselves. That makes sense. I agree. I agree. It takes a special kind of person, too, I think, to work in this field because you are working in sickness Mm -hmm. for a while, especially in like a detox residential level of care, you know, you're getting exposed to a lot. It's almost like working in like a ER almost in a way. I mean, it's except for you're not seeing people come in with gunshot wounds and stuff like that, but you are seeing people with severe mental, emotional, spiritual wounds that are open and a lot of mental health crisis and stuff like that. And you know, I remember when I went went to treatment, um, I saw this girl. Oh, my God. I'll never forget this. Her name was Carrington. And she came in and literally looked like the Hulk. I mean, she was green. And her eyes were yellow. I mean, it was, I mean, you want to talk, and her stomach was distended uh, from, you know, alcoholic-related issues. And uh, I can only imagine, you know three months sober having to tend to this person. I just, I don't know. I think it's, it's, it's something that frustrates me because I know for my situation, I got my first job at a year uh, at Palm beach Institute. And even then it was like, man, I don't know. It was, you, you gotta be a special person. I think. And a lot of times people I think get into, especially, <laughs> I mean, we could probably riff on this for a few minutes. You know, six, eight years ago, you saw people getting involved in this field simply for the money and were doing very uh, shady shit, Uh, you know, patient brokering and all the things, you know, because where there's money to be made, it brings the bad, bad actors. And there was a time, there was a time and place where it was, you know, it was the Wild West. and. You know, fortunately for us sitting here, you know, we were able to navigate that and, you know, the cream rose to the top. Every time it comes up, I want to bring bring up the opportunity to mention like the path that we've all taken because it to me, it sounds like it's all similar. You know, um, you've risen up in the field pr- pretty high. We're where we're at today. And with that being said, people that are getting into the field, oftentimes they want to be where we're at. And granted, again, we've all, you've been almost two decades in the field. We've been over a decade each. But you mentioned something earlier where you said you were working the overnight shift as a tech. And this is, I'm a firm believer that this is why you're at where you're at today, or not the only reason, but like you started from the ground up because I know that now that you know operations, you know what it's like to be on the front line. Absolutely. You know what it's like to probably drive a van and do all that stuff. Like we got to, Tom and I experienced the same thing. And when you get to see 
every single aspect of treatment. And like over the course of time, we got more involved in the clinical. We literally have been in every single part of this and understand it as, as big picture. I, I 100% agree. You know, it's kind of like an addict or an alcoholic when they, when they get sober, they want to do, they want to go right from, from uh, admitting that they're powerless over drugs and alcohol into let me go help other people without doing their, <laughs> without doing the rest of the work. Um, that, that's what, ha- that's what was happening. Um, I think f- a few years, few, few years back where people, you know, just wanted to, thought that, you know, wanted to, you know, have executive titles or, or ran to positions where they believe that there was money at, and they never actually worked in a treatment center. They were not on the front line. They, they didn't know anything about the day, day to day, uh, treatment. And, you know, what's great is most of those people are now in prison. Or, um, but what's also not great is a lot of those people are still around. They're just doing this in other states. So, um, you know, South Florida is definitely, and Florida itself has definitely cleaned up a hundred percent, um, like 90% over the last few years. But there is, you know, th- the problem didn't just go away. It's now, unfortunately, in other, other parts of the country. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you, you've, you're in a unique position too, because we saw it, but you've seen it even prior to when we got involved in treatment where you said when you came down here earlier, you said there was like three treatment centers oh, in the, Florida. The only treatment centers were PBI, um, behavioral health of the Palm beaches and the watershed that, and, and, and summer house down in Miami. And now we're the recovery capital of the world. Yes. So like you were there for that whole transition. And I like that you brought that up. Cause I was going to kind of go there with the whole people got involved in the field. There was like, what, around 2013 probably is when I started picking mm-hmm. up on it. But for instance, you would have somebody that just got out of treatment and because they're so tied into everybody else that's in early recovery, that's likely going to relapse. And Tom was talking about it, where the money is like treatment centers would hire these people to do admissions and, and quote unquote business development, business development marketing. And meanwhile, when, you know, I was living in Boynton beach at the time and, uh, I would drive down federal highway and there would be all these guys standing outside the Starbucks on, uh, at federal and, uh, federal and Atlantic, the old Starbucks. Mm-hmm. And they just literally would wait there with, to, for kids to be walking down the street with suitcases. Cause they knew they got kicked out of their halfway houses and they would flock, flock to the, they would flock to these kids and they were all kids. Um, you know, like a like a like a bunch of hunters. Um, what's your insurance policy? Like uh, you know, like uh, how old are you? Uh, and then they would sell them off to the highest bidder. It was it, it was disgusting um, because I remember a time when that Starbucks is where we all used to go and we do step work with our sponsors and and uh, and talk about what's going on in our life. And then it became a place of um, where people would go and pray on the unfortunate. And people in need, you know, um, thank God that's not around anymore. But those were all people with two days out of treatment, five days out of treatment, 90 days clean that, that were, that were, that were doing this. And most of those people are in jail or they unfortunately, uh, are still doing it. They're just doing it in other States. Well, I imagine too, like, for instance, like that's why your reputation so good. Like, cause we've only met in person recently, what, a couple months ago and only actually like sat down to talk to get to know each other in the last couple weeks probably but to be around that long you've seen what not to do and everybody knows that well like all that was going on you're one of the guys that chose to do the right thing do the right thing do the right thing because man that was tough dude when we're down when we were down here i remember like 2015 2016 you know and and just to call it what it is, you're a center and your job is to get people into treatment. And then you got some guy down, you know, standing right a block away from the door of your treatment center, like offering cash to clients to go, dude, I was, it was, it was tough, man, to like, but at no time for myself, was I ever going to give in and say, I'm going to do what they're doing, but that's why we're still here. Exactly. And, and I knew that even back then that, that, you know, there's a, there's a shortcut and then there's the, what's doing what's right. And that was something that was instilled to me by, by my dad when I, when I was a kid, um, you know, and you always do the right thing. If it doesn't pay off, it might not pay off as fast or fast as other things, but if you do the right thing, it'll all pay off in the end. And we're all still here and these people are not, are not. Still mm-hmm. So let's pivot to your sobriety over the years. Cause you have, you're coming up on 20 years. 
<clears throat> Correct. Tell us, um, like in the beginning, what was important for you to stay sober first and foremost? And like, what were some of the uh, most influential things kind of in your sobriety? You know what I mean? So um, some of the, so I would say the, I, I found a really good group of people um, when, when I came out of treatment. Um, I went to a halfway house in Delray and I got, you know, met, met you know, got, encircled with a group group of guys um mo mostly a group of guys that were 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 have been uh sober for a year plus and um and they were out there just doing the right thing and not just doing the right thing and and wor working a program they're out there having fun you know they were they were they weren't just you know sitting around going to meetings all day which they were going to meetings but they were also they were also having fun they were also acting like how normal people would what we would consider normies would would act um just without drinking drinking or, dr or, or or drugging you know they would still go to go to the sports bar on sun sundays and watch football um you know i love i love that atmosphere um and we would all just kind of uh rely rely on each other if one of us had a problem or we knew somebody was going through something personally we would all be be there for them um so Pretty much that, along with working a program, which you know was always taught to me, working a program is working the twelve steps. Um, that that's what really what what did it for me. And and I kind of, you know, my spot, my first sponsor always used to say to me, you know, AA gives us a life, but we don't let it become our life. And and that this is just a um, this is just the beginning of your of your journey. Um, so you know, for I indulged years into Alcoholics Anonymous, but at the same time, I realized that. You know, I wasn't going to let AA become my life, but I, it was always going to be a part of my life, but I was not going to be able to, I was not going to let it become my life. And I, I was still, it, it taught me how to be a functioning person um, uh, in, in society and be able to do everything that normies could do without, without drugs and alcohol. That huh. makes it makes any sense. Yeah, that's my mentality. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think that's one of Tom's pet peeves because like, and I'm of that camp too, where if, if this is your lifestyle, I'm not knocking it. Like whatever works for sure. you, to each their own, you know, respectfully. But like, I was never of the mentality, like I'll never tell my sponsor, if you don't make a meeting every single day for the rest of your life, you're going to, you're going to die of alcoholism. <laughs> like, <laughs> But there's people out there that do say that. Yeah. Yeah. Like. I mean, what happens if one day you end up in a hospital or something like you missed your meeting? Now you're dead. Like, <laughs> yeah, but even <laughs> even if OK, there's always going to be the situations that you can't go to meetings. But even if. I wake up in the morning and I say, you know what, I'm today, I don't feel like going to meeting to a meeting. That is OK. And the problem is, is when people get so dependent on others like, I understand having a sense of community and having the people that you can rely on and stuff like that. That's vastly different than relying on people to make decisions for you. We come to a point in our sobriety when we need to be able to make decisions for ourselves. And there are people out there and there's groups out there inside 12-step programs that do not set people up for that. And they more say, every decision that you make you need to run by me. And if you don't run it by me, chances are that's you're going to make the wrong decision. That's the shit that I can't I can't deal with and some of that lies within AA. I totally agree with the community aspect of it. That to me is the most important thing out of all of it, out of meetings, step work, uh uh, uh service commitments, all the things. Community is by far the most important in my own opinion. I agree with you. One one hundred percent I agree I agree with you. Because if I didn't have that community, I don't think that I I, I I'm not sure if I would be here. You know, um, you know, because I, I dealt with I dealt with a lot more things sober, you know, obviously because I got so young than I did uh than I did uh when I was getting high. And I had to deal with what you know, what we call life on life's terms. You know, things that sometimes were out of my control, you know, uh, you know, a death of uh the death of my father, which was who's who was my best friend, which was the hardest thing I ever dealt with in my life. Um, two, you know, two marriages, two divorces, kid, have two, two, uh, two kids, 
So it was um, a lot of life stuff. And if I didn't have the circle that I had back then and the circle that I have now, um, and a lot of the a handful of the people are still the same people, um, mm -hmm. you know, through through all these things. Um, I'm not sure if I would st I would still be here. Yeah, anybody can walk into a meeting. Anybody can walk in and and do steps. Anybody can go and serve coffee in a meeting. But if you do those things alone, it's not sustainable. Like if you're going to go and take a service commitment, you take the service commitment. But and when I say service commitment, you're a greeter, you're serving, or you're making coffee, you're sweeping the floors, you're stacking chairs, whatever it is. Do it, do it well, but simultaneously while you're doing it, look at that as an opportunity to get to know people because those service commitments oftentimes happen before the meeting and after the meeting. And in my personal opinion, I think that those, th those kind of like end caps, the before the meeting and after the meeting are the most important part. Yeah. It's all about a balance to kind of hit your, your point home, Tom. There's a line in the big book that says, after all, God gave us brains to use. Mm-hmm. Like at no point is everybody else supposed to 100% do the thinking for you and make decisions for you. And in particular, also like step 10 references the fact that we, once we learn how to use our will, it says it's the proper use of the will exercises all you wish, mm -hmm. right? So like the way that I kind of look at it, those first nine steps, like, yes, I need the guidance. I probably kind of need you to tell me what to do here and there. But like when you get to 10, 11, and 12, at that point, you've worked those first nine steps so that you now you're thinking and, and you're aligned with God's will or God's plans or what you think God would want to have you do, being a principled person yeah. if you struggle with the God thing. But at the end of the day, too, like I also know for myself, going back to the community portion, like I do need men in my life that I can go to and talk to. It's not that I'm going to you and saying, hey, I need you to make this decision for me and I need you to tell me what to do, but I, I do want insight from other healthy men who have been through similar situations. To be completely transparent, Josh and I have been talking the last 24 hours about some personal stuff, you know, but and, and that goes back to the fact for me, I know this is a guy that's worked 12 steps. I know this is a guy who has a good reputation, lives his life by principles. Like he's somebody I want to hear his opinion. And at the end of the day, I'm going to take that into account to help help me kind of make the decisions. And I, and as a sponsor, too, I would never want to be responsible for making a decision for somebody else. Like, what if I tell somebody, if you don't do this, your wife's going to leave you? Like, and then you do what I tell you and she left you anyway? Like, whose fault is that, dude? I'm going to have the finger pointing back at me, right? Of course. Like, dude, I'm I'm not putting myself in that position. Well, that's why sponsors, I mean, need to stay in their own lane, you know, and unfortunately over the years, it's morphed into more than just taking somebody through the 12 steps. It's morphed into a lot more than that. So what's, uh, so you're at Harmony Hills now and you're, what are you? Vice president? Vice president of business development. Um, so I kind of, a few years ago, um, and I, I really found my passion is, you know, obviously SUD is is a huge part part of my heart. But that's um, substance use disorder substance use for disorder. our listeners. Yeah. Um, but my passion is really mental health, and I had the opportunity at Destination Hope, um, where I worked about twelve years ago, to open up the first private mental health program in the, in the state of Florida. And I took that when I left Destination Hope to go over to Banyan, and now we've been doing this at, at Harmony at Harmony Hills. And um, you know, part of the reason is you know part of part of my own journey. Um, you know, something that I didn't really get a chance to talk talk about earlier is kind of where I grew up in Philadelphia. Addiction and mental health are you know you don't discuss it. It's looked at as a weakness. Um, people ask me all the time why I don't you know, post my sobriety date um, or, or or when I have like have anniversaries is because it's still, there's still people up there that, that don't get, that don't, that, I, that even people in my family that don't consider addiction a, a, a disease, they look at it as a weakness. Um, and, um, and the same thing with mental health. And one of the things, you know, besides addiction that I've o o always dealt with was anxiety. And, and it took me to address my own personal anxiety about till I was about 16 years sober, something I never wanted to deal with, something I never wanted to, wanted to address. Um, and cause I, 
you know, just like addiction in my, it was rooted in my head that it was, um, it was a weakness. And, and I finally, it took me, you know, going through a divorce, um, and, uh, to, f to finally deal with my anxiety and, you know, cause 12 steps is great, but the 12 steps alone, like it's not going to cure social anxiety or, or, anxi or anxiety disorders. And, um, and being able to, you know, address my own anxiety and, you know, work in that aspect, um, have my career more focused on the mental health now rather than the, uh, rather than the SUD, which we still treat SUD, but, you know, Harmony Hills itself is a primary mental health program. And, you know, for people who have anxiety, for people with depression, for people with schizophrenia. So, um, and it's, and it's, so I have, you know, I have a passion for both worlds, but, um, but, you know, I'm still, you know, nowadays my passion lies more in, in mental health than it is for substance abuse. Well, I tell you what, Harmony Hills, um, we just recently had on Tyler, um, well, that episode isn't out yet, but it will be coming out soon. And, uh, what's he do there? Uh, he's our business, uh, I forget his exact title, but he, he, he works in business development. Um, I want to say he's, um, uh, our, uh, overseas account, account ma management, uh, something, something along those Yeah. Lines. Well, and the reason I bring him up is because, um, I think you can tell directly like the quality of a program based on the people that work there and having him on and Eddie Wads, who was on a long time ago. And now you, um, it's quality people that work there and the same here, like everybody that works here, uh, you know, we're, we, we don't do it because we're making a ton of money. I mean, we all make an honest living We're we're able to provide for our families and, and all the things, but like our employees have been here since day one. Mm -hmm. You know, I think our, our, the person that's been here the least is what? Shermaine. Shermaine. And he's coming up on two years probably. And then and that's next. Cause, that's because we needed to add somebody, not because anybody left. <laughs> sure. Right. Like we yeah. Need, we need one more person to make us better. Yeah. And, and he was an alumni of ours, you know, and uh, next to that, I think is like probably four years, you know? So um, that's why I bring that up, you know, and Harmony Hills, I've, I was there the one time, man, that's out in the middle of nowhere. Nowhere. Holy <laughs> cow. They got a Bucky's. Yeah, you ain't leaving that place. Uh, Eddie Eddie took us up there to do a tour, and I remember he took us to some taco truck. Yeah, it's, yeah. There's a taco truck about a, about a mile down the road. Yeah, and that's like the thing that's, to do. That's Tom's love language, taco, taco truck. Yeah, that was good. It was How can legit. Have a good uh, taco wow. truck, you know. Yeah. Um, no, that's exciting though. I mean, I'm glad to see that you guys are. You know, the mental health aspect. A lot of times, people kind of want to steer away from it. Cause it's tough. It's difficult, you know, and, and full transparency, we don't like taking, you know, a lot of high psych because we're not equipped. It's not that we don't want to, it's just that we're not equipped to, and there's facilities out there that are equipped to do that. Like places like yours. Uh, so, you know, we could, we could, take. we just wouldn't be doing them a service. Right. Of course. We just, we're not. Yeah. Yeah. And ju just like how us, we don't take a primary substance use disorder patient because we're, we'd be doing them a disservice. Mm -hmm. um, well, if they're co-occurring, but the mental health is more prevalent, we will take them. But if they're a 19-year-old kid with maybe some depression, um, using heroin um, or opiates, we're probably not the facility for, the, for, for them. I well, and because you're throwing them into a place. And look, I was when I was there, I mean, you, you can, and I'm not like, you go into a primary mental health facility versus a primary substance abuse facility. There's a vast difference. I mean, you can tell where, when you're in a primary mental health facility, you know, and so to put somebody in there that doesn't necessarily belong, it does them a disservice because, you know, they're in there with people that are schizophrenic and having potentially active hallucinations yep. and stuff like that. Versus, you know, you put somebody in here that's having active hallucinations and audible hallucinations and seeing things and yada, yada, yada into a primary substance abuse facility. It's not good for them, you know, and it's not good for the community. That's what I think makes for a good center, though, with it as, as far as integrity goes, 
know what your purpose is, know the population that you're focusing on helping and don't pretend to be good at everything. Like yeah. you guys do what you do and you do it well. For us, we do the PHP IOP for substance abuse model. We found what works for us and we stick to it. Absolutely. We don't pretend to be masters at everything because that's when it gets messy. Exactly. And you guys have a reputation of being, you know, one of the best for, for what, what you guys do. It's when everybody wants to be a, be a master of all trades, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. it is, is when it, when it starts getting messy, you know, we, we do what we do and we know we're very good at what we do, just like how you guys do what you do. And you guys are one of the best at what you do. We don't try to be, be somebody who we're not. And just, just, and that's how I think all the good programs are. Yeah. is is they do what they say oh, my dad used to, another quote my dad used to say um do what you say and say what you do you know and uh and and don't do anything uh don't do anything extra and uh and that's what makes a good program a quality program a quality program yeah well that was fun boys yeah yeah i'm glad we got to sit down and I have to do this more often. Oh, it was it was, uh, it, was a, it was a pleasure being here, and uh, I appreciate you guys having me. And it's uh, it was awesome to do a podcast with both of you. And uh, not too often you get a bodybuilder and a boxer in the same room. So, yep. And I'm just here having my Celsius, and uh, you know, the, the boxer is more dangerous. I'm just gonna throw that. Yeah, out there. it depends. <laughs> yeah, I would agree with. That. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Ben couldn't fight his way out of a. Well, you know, it's a, funny a, though. I gotta tell this real quick. Last night. I'm at Target. And, dude, you know, I I know I got the shaved head and the beard. And if you don't know me, you might be a little intimidated looking. So I'm with Kai at Target. And Kai's at the end with the cart blocking. And there's a Spanish-speaking couple in the middle of the aisle. And I, like, look past them. And I tell Kai, I'm like, Kai, get out the way. You're blocking the aisle. Like, from, like, 15 yards away. This poor couple thought I was talking to them. And, oh, yes, sir. And literally, like, ran out the aisle, and this other dude was standing there, just started dying laughing, because <laughs> they thought I was, like, going psycho on them. They took off. Dude, <laughs> I was like, I felt so bad. I'm like, no, 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 my kid. And I don't think they understood what I was saying. <laughs> Oh man, they were like, "You psycho!" Oh, listen, if if I if I saw you walking down in a hallway, yo, and get out the aisle, I'd, I'd probably get out the aisle. I don't know. You, you know? know, I was being stern with my kid, like, dude. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, anyways. Man. All right, well, let's wrap this up. Thanks, Josh, for coming on. Thanks, and, guys. Uh, that's it. All right, that is it for this episode of Real Recovery Talk. Thank you, thank you, thank you for tuning in. In the end, if you have any comments, questions, or concerns, you can always reach us, info at realrecoverytalk.com. Again, that's info at realrecoverytalk.com. And ultimately, we want to help you turn your mess into your message. That is it. We will see y'all later.